Good evening, everyone. We'll just give it another minute uh, to allow some more participants to join in. Uh, but it's really exciting to see everybody joining in tonight. All right, good evening, everyone. We'll get started. Uh, I know I still see some participants rolling in, but uh, we wanna make sure that we give ourselves as much time as possible for this awesome topic that we're gonna discuss tonight. Uh, so welcome, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this event on female athlete health. My name is Poonam Sandhu. I'm the head coach of the UBC Women's Field Hockey Program, and I will be your moderator for the evening. Uh, I'm also a former national team athlete and UBC varsity athlete, uh, and so this topic is very close to my heart. Uh, however, before I go any further, I do want to recognize the lens that we have the privilege of working and playing on at UBC, which is situated on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam peoples. With a virtual setting comes remote working opportunities, uh, so I would also like to acknowledge that I'm calling you from my home in Cloverdale, BC, which is situated on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Kwantlen, Katsi, Semiamu, and Coast Salish peoples. We recognize that you're all joining us from many different parts of these lands, so we encourage you to use the chat feature and share with us where you're calling in from. Along with that, we would love for you to drop your name in, uh, include what sport you're associated with, what organization you're associated with, uh, and any other, any other information that you would like to share. Uh, it's always great to see who we're connecting with in these virtual events. Before we get started, we do have two poll questions that we would like, like you all to answer. Um, number one is, where are you joining us from? What department are you associated with? And the second question is, what level of knowledge or comfort around the topic of female athlete health do you bring in? So we have a scale, one to five, one being no education or no prior knowledge on the topic, uh, and five being very knowledgeable and, and very comfortable speaking on the topic. So if you could please go ahead and answer those questions for us, that would be fantastic. The information that you share with us today is going to be used by our team after the event. Uh, this information is very important um, in the way that we uh, build for future opportunities. Um, and so we really appreciate your participation and feedback. As you fill out the polls, I will just keep one, I will just explain one housekeeping detail. Uh, there will be a Q&A portion at the end of the event. Um, so please make sure that you put in your questions. Uh, you can also pop in your questions to the Q&A event throughout the, the, the discussion. So as your questions arise, please go ahead, pop them into the Q&A section and we will be sure to answer them at the end of the event. Okay. So Ryan, I don't know if we've got the, the second question popping up for everybody. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, moving on. So today is International Women's Day. And on this day, we want to recognize the strong, powerful, and beautiful women all around the world. For this reason, I am extremely excited to highlight the amazing women that we have on our panel tonight. First on our panel, 
is Samantha Pritchard. Sam is the Senior Manager of Sport Science and Sport Medicine for Athletics at the University of British Columbia. Oh, my notes are covered. For, in this role, she oversees the Integrated Support Team or IST, which involves connecting with coaches and staff to plan strategically on how the IST can best support athletes. Prior to joining UBC, Sam was the lead of performance analysis and biomechanics at Canadian Sport Institute Pacific. She worked with various sports ranging from the development team to the national teams with the majority of her time working with Freestyle Canada and Wheelchair Rugby Canada. She has served as a performance analysis and technology specialist with the Team Canada mission staff at various multi-sport games, including Canada Commonwealth Games, Pan American Games, and Olympic Games. Most recently, Sam served in this role for the 2022 Winter Olympic Games in Beijing last month, working with the Mountain Bay Sports. Sam holds a BSc and MSc in kinesiology from McMaster University, a certificate in human performance training from Sheridan College, and a certificate in women in leadership from Cornell University. She has also served twice as a mentor in the Women in Sports Science Mentorship Program. Please help me to welcome Sam. And we encourage you to say hello to her through the chat feature as well. Next on our panel, we have Amanda Jones. Amanda is in her fourth year as the Assistant Strength and Conditioning Coach for the University of British Columbia's Varsity Athletics Program. In this role, she oversees the SNC programs for the women's basketball, field hockey, rugby, soccer, softball, and volleyball teams. Yes, all of those teams. She also works closely with the integrated support team to carry out training plans and supervises a team of graduate and undergraduate student coaches in the varsity gym. In addition to her SNC role at UBC, Amanda teaches a third year kin kinesiology course, creating effective developmentally appropriate physical activity learning environments. Prior to joining UBC, Amanda worked at Fortia Sport and Health as the Kids Move Coordinator and Strength and Conditioning Coach. There, she was responsible for the development and implementation of a physical and health education program for elementary schools in Burnaby and worked with a wide variety of national collegiate and youth athletes, as well as private clientele. Welcome, Amanda. Next on the panel, we have Dr. Lauren McBride. Dr. McBride is a registered psychologist in British Columbia and a mental performance consultant in Vancouver, BC. Dr. McBride has practiced as a staff psychologist at the University of British Columbia for over a decade. As part of her role at UBC, she provides mental health and mental performance support to UBC varsity athletes across 26 teams. Her background in both sport and counseling psychology provides a unique perspective to the concerns of student athletes. Dr. McBride has also worked as a consultant for the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific since 2008 supporting various national and provincial sport organizations. She's also had the privilege to support Canadian team athletes in the 2014 Winter Games, which were held in Sochi, Russia. Welcome, Dr. McBride. Next on the panel, we have Emma McCredden. Emma is a lecturer in sport and exercise nutrition for the School of Kinesiology. She was appointed in 2016 to a newly created position, which was evenly distributed between the school and the Department of Athletics as sport dietitian for the UBC Thunderbird Varsity Program. She qualified as a dietitian with honors from the University of Ulster and later completed a master's degree at Loughborough University in sports nutrition and exercise physiology. During this time, she was awarded the Gatorade Sports Science Institute Award for academic performance. Emma has provided nutrition and support as part of the multidisciplinary sports science and sports med team for English Institute of Sport and was the lead dietitian for Leinster Rugby based in Dublin, Ireland. She later moved to Canada in 2013 where she joined the Canadian Sport Institute and provided support for various national teams, including the women's soccer team and swim team in preparation for the Rio Olympic games. And most recently has been the consultant dietitian for the Vancouver Whitecaps. Welcome Emma. And finally, we would like to introduce Dr. Maria Gallo. Maria is a former national team athlete with the Rugby Sevens, Fifteens, and Bobsleigh programs. Maria was also inducted into the Rugby Canada Hall of Fame in 2018 and is currently a professor of teaching at UBC. Maria has a PhD in exercise physiology and has over 10 years of coaching experience in high-performance sport. 
Maria is committed to the highest pedagogic standards and is dedicated to her educational leadership roles within the School of Kinesiology. Maria teaches a first year core co course in health and exercise prescription and a graduate course in the area of sports science. She's an advisor of the Master in Kinesiology and the Director of Masters in High Performance Coaching and Technical Leadership, a program she created eight years ago. Her recent coaching experiences include Tokyo 2020 with the Female Sevens Rugby Team, and she's looking forward to the World Cup 15s competition in New Zealand in the fall of 2022. Welcome, Maria. Well, first off, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for making time out of your busy schedules to be here with us tonight. Uh, you're such rock stars in your own individual ways, and I'm so excited to be able to pick your brains on the topic of female athlete health tonight. I want to start with Maria and Sam, uh, because we know that female sport has been evolving, and there's so many strides that we as female athletes have made over the years in high performance sport. So in your perspective, what is the current landscape of high performance sport and development? And Maria, we'll go with you first. Sure, thanks Poonam and, and uh, happy Women's Day to everybody out there. Hope you're having a great evening. Um, as we all probably already know, maybe common sense at this point that you know women face more barriers than men in, in many careers and, and coaching is no different. Um, you don't see as many women in leadership roles. And, and when I mean leadership roles, I mean head coach roles, uh, not just assistant coaches, um, technical leaders, uh, director of programs and such. And, and very often the reason why we don't see women in these roles um, could be to various reasons. You know, sometimes work family conflicts aren't allowing women to, you know, climb, climb that ladder, for example. Um, coaching in particular, there's a lot of burnout affiliated with that type of career choice. There's a lot of travel, a lot of planning many days away. Um, it's not uncommon for people to be gone 200 calendar days in a year, um, which makes that family, um, you know, uh, dynamic really difficult. Um, it could be accounted because of the limited opportunities and definitely the gender stereotypes that women might actually encounter in, in these coaching roles. And, and we know that the stereotypes, you know, I'll just name you a few, but this is not an exclusive list. Um, very often the stereotype that women coaches get, or female coaches, I should say, is that they're less qualified than male coaches, that male athletes won't respect a female um, coach, that um, women are softer than males when it comes to being a tough coach, having high expectations and being able to perform under, uh, under duress or under pressure, um, that perhaps are unable to manage the locker room situation. You know, I can go on and on about the, the gender stereotypes that female coaches encounter. And, and, and we know that that makes, you know, that career choice difficult for women. Um, I think, you know, back in the 70s, I think it was 1972, where Title IX came into effect, um, that law that, that tried to promote uh, gender equality, um, about 90% of all female teams were being coached by women, right? Um, and when you look at, obviously, this is going to be different in different sports and obviously different in the USA versus Canada, which is most of where the research is coming from, um, that is now maybe at 40%. And it can go to as low as 20% in, in other sports. So women are not in these leadership roles. Um, reasons being, you know, those salaries became competitive and maybe more palatable for males to start applying for those positions. Um, and so women were no longer coaching women. Um, when you look at the stats, um, I would say only 3% of uh, men's teams are being coached by women. Um, and as little as 20% of female teams are being coached by women. And, and a bit more of a, another stat is only um, about 80% of athletic directors are men, and that only leaves 20%. So the problem being is we're, we're not being represented in basically in this type of uh, career choice. Um, as, as you mentioned, I, I direct the Masters of High Performance, and, and we have sport coaches in that program, but we also have technical leaders. And even in our student enrollment, only one third of our cohort are women. You, you are one of our uh, alumni of the certificate. And so we're still not getting that, that representation. And so one of the things we try to do with our curriculum a little bit is, is try, ex try to expose the grad student to the bias that is in research. 
right? As, as I'm sure your uh, dietitian and, and your strength and conditioning coach will go on and on if there is lack of research done on women, right? Um, we, from a physiology perspective, are not small men. Um, from a psychology perspective, you know, we're also uh, very different. And I'll just quote a, a fellow colleague of, of mine, um, Dr. Shauna Taylor, she's an instructor in, in, the, uh, in the program, a certified clinical counselor. And basically the research is, is baked with lots of bias, right? And this doesn't just include women coaching men, but men coaching women, men coaching men. Um, and so there's lots of cultural biases and assumptions, and these are found extensively throughout the literature. And basically the conclusions that are drawn are basically flawed, right? So I think, you know, we, we are making, we are evolutionizing, we are making some changes um, in the sport culture. And we are kind of at the forefront of a new frontier where we need to kind of level the field um, to view all coaches as equal, right, regardless of gender. And, and today we're mostly speaking about gender, uh, but we can't forget the whole idea of intersectionality, right? Not all women are the same. My experiences as a Latina coming to Canada as an immigrant are very different than um, yours, Puna, right? So we need to still consider race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation. And I feel like we're way far behind in those more complex topics than just gender itself. So I am excited for the future of, of you know, women in sport, uh, but I do think there's, there's lots to be learned um, and we need to push that, that envelope. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about what could be some actionable items later. Uh, but that's just to paint you a picture of kind of where we are in, in sport and women in, in Canada. Thanks so much, Maria. Fantastic perspective. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's so much we can discuss. Uh, Sam, I want to push it to you from an IST perspective. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Poonam. And uh, definitely uh, tough to follow, Maria. That was such a great answer. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit both IST and, and administratively as well. Um, and I'm really glad that Maria brought up the point about, um, you know, there, there's less representation of women in coaching. And, and part of that is really what's kind of leading to some of these other aspects of where we might not see uh, the female representation happening as well. So overall, I, I do think we are improving and we are developing. But we don't see nearly as many administrators and IST members that are female than male. Um, the stats in Canada are a little bit better than the US, so go us on that one. Um, but usually we're around kind of the 40 to 60%. So we're getting really close to that um, equality standpoint, but um, there's definitely areas where we can improve. And part of that, I think, is, is because of that lack of representation in the coaching sphere. So, you know, there are a lot more men that are coaching and, and often the natural transition um, is for, you know, head coaches to move on to technical leadership roles, high performance directors, it, more administrative. Um, so if that pipeline is much more defined for men, there's going to be a, a, a greater number of them moving on to those other roles. And so on the female side, you know, we're still building that pipeline, we're still building that pathway. And, and it really comes down to getting people in at the grassroots level and, and moving them through the sports system to get them into those leadership roles. And when we look at, you know, CEOs or um, presidents of boards at the Canadian sport level, that's where we're, we're probably struggling the most. That's where we're getting down to just creeping up on 40% um, in the statistics. And so that's something that, you know, as, as a society, we, we need to continue to push. But um, looking at the stats that the Canadian women in sport have put together, that has progressed over the last five, 10 years, which is, is great to see. It's really optimistic. Um, so we just kind of have to keep pushing that forward. Um, from a sports science side, I would say, you know, we are quite privileged that that is probably the sphere where we, we see a lot of representation from, from women. Um, but I will add a caveat that there is a little bit of a disparity between disciplines. So you look at a, a dietitian's conference, and Emma can speak to this as well, you know, that is heavily represented in, in the female area. That's a, a topic that seems to attract a lot of women too. Um, but then, you know, you look at Amanda and Amanda is, you know, one of very few female strength coaches at the university level in Canada. Um, I think there's a, you know, we can count on our single hand how many we have in Canada alone. So I think that that's something that we need to look at that. Yes, if you look at us on a global statistic, the IST, we look very equitable, 
But when you dive down into certain disciplines, you're seeing a lack of representation. So I think we also have to acknowledge, you know, why is that? Why do we have more men in strength and conditioning? Why do we have fewer of them in dietetics? You know, same thing goes for biomechanics and, and you know, biomedical engineering, psychology, you know, the diversity is not, is not quite there yet in those spaces. So we really do have to, you know, encourage um, women in those fields to, to be represented as we need to, you know, acknowledge that men need to be represented in those spheres, you know. We, we do need more male dietitians because they will help understand, you know, the male um, a little bit better. And I'm sure Emma will get into that a little bit later. But overall, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful and, and we are still improving and developing. And that that's really exciting to see. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, I think we, you've just both laid it out very clearly. You know, there are we've definitely made strides. Uh, we've taken steps in the right direction, but there's so much more that we need to continue to do and we need to continue to have these conversations. Um, the next question is for Amanda, Emma, and Lauren. Uh, recognizing that you all work very closely with female athletes and that you often take an individual approach, what are some considerations that you would factor in when working with female athletes? Uh, Amanda, we'll start with you. Awesome. Thanks, Poonam. Um, so yeah, uh, as mentioned, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. So uh, most of my role is within the weight room or um, on the field of play, um, helping with any sort of like strength training, uh, warm ups, cool downs, um, conditioning work, uh, plyometric. It goes on and on, but um, you know more so the physical preparation side. So um, when I'm trying to you know, maximize our athletes overall health, well-being and performance. Um, I'm going to have to look at the physiological and also the psychological differences um, between the sexes, but also within um, women themselves. Um, so like taking these considerations uh, into account for the actual planning, but also implementation of strength and conditioning becomes very important. Um, some of the topics uh, and areas that I think about a lot more um, or that differs from our male counterparts would be um, like our age and our puberty uh, and how that relates to our menstrual cycle. So knowing that kind of up until puberty, uh, we're relatively similar to males in almost all respects. And then it's once we hit puberty around that age of 12, um, that things start to really um, kind of diverge there. Uh, in that we have now a monthly cycle of hormones. We have some bodily changes uh, in terms of like size and shape and composition. So knowing uh, the age that we're working with and how, um, yeah, like how that's going to affect uh, the training that they do and their adaptation to that training. Um, so that would be the first one. Um, after that, looking at physiology. Um, so we know that on average, females are shorter. Um, they're lighter in total weight, um, and we do have a higher percentage of body fat uh, due to the fact that we're preparing for pregnancy and we have higher um, estrogen levels and need a higher percentage of body fat to um, just for, for daily life. Um, so knowing like those things and how that's going to affect um, our movement patterns and our adaptations to some of our training um, and things like that. Also looking at our bone structure. Uh, so are we fully developing in terms of like our bone mineral density uh, throughout puberty um, and uh, knowing that we have probably a, a wider pelvis um, and shorter feet than males. Again, this is going to affect like our biomechanics and uh, the way that we move and um, some other things uh, as well. So Knowing those differences um, is going to be super important in terms of, again, that planning and implementation of my strength and conditioning training. Um, after, or kind of, I guess, part of physiology would be, again, if you are dealing with an athlete who is uh, past that age of puberty and they're having a menstrual cycle, knowing what that is, um, knowing what's regular, knowing um, what is normal and is okay. Um, we know that 75 to 85% of women have uh, like premenstrual symptoms. So leading up to and or during our menstrual cycle, or sorry, leading up to or during our period. So that time that we're actually bleeding during the month. Um, 
like three quarters of us are going to have some sort of symptoms, um, whether that's like uh, abdominal pain and cramps, lower back pain, headache, nausea, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, the list goes on. Um, but so many of us experience these symptoms um, for varying amounts of days and the intensity. Uh, but that's something that we have to take into account because it's probably going to affect how we're able to train, like how hard we're able to drain, how well we're able to train, um, things like decision-making and whatnot can all be affected. So knowing what is normal and talking to your athletes about um, some experiences that they might be seeing or dealing with um, and being able to make some changes based off of that. Um, Three other things I would say uh, are knowing like pelvic floor health is going to be super important when working with female athletes. So it's part of our deep core and it helps stabilize our base. Um, but female athletes are actually at a quite high risk for pelvic floor dysfunction and or like urinary incontinence. So um, if you're working with athletes that are uh, a repetitive high impact sport, this is something that should be talked about and made aware to them. Um, so that if they are experiencing any pain or issues with um, like incontinence or any of those things, uh, that they know that there's, that's kind of normal um, and that there's someone that they can reach out to for help. Same thing goes for breast health. It's something that we, you know, have to deal with that males don't and just um, making sure that they know like, you know, a, the sports bra is your friend and you need to find one that's super supportive and fits really well for you. Um, otherwise it's probably going to affect like how you feel, whether it's how comfortable you feel doing certain exercise or, um, your actual ability to perform if it isn't, uh, fitting super well. So, um, taking into account the activities that you're asking them to do, um, and how that affects, uh, like the breast motion and movement. And then, um, I would say the biggest part for my role as a strength and conditioning coach is keeping our athletes healthy. Um, so reducing the risk of injury. Um, we know that uh, females are like two to six times higher to uh, tear their ACL, um, which is a really tough injury to go through considering the rehab is so long and strenuous. Um, so avoiding that at all costs. Uh, we know that stress fractures are two to four times higher in females. I talked about bone mineral density a bit earlier, um, but that is a risk factor for females. Um, and the, yeah, the risk of them having that type of an injury is higher, um, as well as ankle sprains, anterior knee pain, and concussions. So um, all in all, we don't have uh, injuries in our, our yeah, we're, we're not set up very well for uh, staying, staying healthy in the current landscape. Um, some of these things are modifiable and some of them are not. Um, so we just need to take what we can and control what we can in that sense and make sure that we're preparing the athletes and making them as robust as possible so that they can keep doing what they love, which is playing their sport. Um, and we can do that in many different ways in terms of uh, strength and conditioning training. And the last thing I'll just hit on is um, self-esteem and body image. So Maria brought up a lot of points about some stereotypes within uh, females in sport. Um, and I think the weight room is a really big area where there, there are some stereotypes. There are some um, hesitations around looking a certain way or um, yeah, lifting weights and becoming bulky or uh, just not feeling comfortable in the weight room. So that's something that I also need to keep in consideration uh, and try to make that a really positive space for our athletes to come into, to want to, to feel comfortable to, um, and to know that like we care first and foremost about your health and your performance, not about the way that you look um, and your body image. So a lot of things to consider um, in order to like really plan and implement our strength and conditioning training with the, the athletes that we work with. Amazing. Um, Emma, I'm just going to pass it right on to you. Thanks, Poonam. Yeah, I feel like Amanda and I are going to probably cross over a little bit in this because our areas do kind of, uh, yeah, they touch on the same, uh, some of the same focuses. But I think from my perspective, like uh, I think, um, and a couple of the speakers have already mentioned this, that, you know, we, we are on the cusp, thankfully, of so much research, hopefully in the next five, 10 years coming out on, on females and, and high performance sport and, 
lots of well-known world-renowned nutrition researchers are really reflecting on their own bias I I was listening to a podcast with a really well-known researcher from Liverpool John Moores last week who who looked at his own data set and in 20 years of research less than six percent of his papers have been on females and high performance sport and you know he never advertised himself as a, as a male high performance sport specialist but he realizes now that that's what he's become in in the nutrition world so you know I, I think it is it's a, a landmark moment I think for us but equally I sort of try to think that um from a mechanistic point of view research in female athletes is incredibly important and I don't doubt that there will be those eureka moments over the next few years where researchers find something really you know incredible in, in female physiology that can make a big difference to performance but I don't feel like we should turn our backs on everything that we know from the research where nutrition is concerned that has been done on females in a uh, high performance sport where we didn't note the menstrual cycle or male and high performance sport because mechanistically we need to know that but sometimes when you when you uh, take a step back and look at what this actually means for nutrition planning and performance um, all athletes have so many improvements to make in the the nutrition basics that they do particularly at the university level as well where you know there are countless food diaries that I see where athletes no matter what sport they're in male or female need to increase their protein intake need to focus more on calcium iron etc and you know we can make those improvements now without waiting five or ten years for this data to come out specifically in female health so I think it's not to send the message out there to coaches and athletes that we can't do anything until this research comes in front of us we can do a lot now to support female health um for me, and Amanda's listed a lot of the areas that I would be concerned with as well, but certainly adequate fueling is probably the one um, major thing that I find time and time again that I'm concerned with, with female, our female athletes. Um, we are, our female athletes are in a difficult position where they are trying to navigate this conflicting space really of the the social media body image kind of environment and fueling their body as an athlete and as a high performance athlete and I think um you know with the age demographic that we deal with and, and Lauren and I cross paths a lot with this that they're just really conflicted they're finding their space as an adult they're finding their space as an athlete and unfortunately many times with female athletes it results in in inadequate fueling um, it happens in males as well, and I do want to acknowledge that, but a lot of the, the epidemiological data that's been done on university high performance sport athletes consistently shows that it's more of a problem with females than with males. Um, so that's one thing that if, any, if a female team or an athlete presents in front of me, that's certainly something that I would want to address with them if I felt the need to, because as Amanda said, um, an unhealthy athlete is, is an underperforming athlete and if there's concerns around fueling then that's something I'd, I'd want to address with them um, and then there's the very obvious ones that many of the coaches and people listening will know of you know we uh, women have a period they have a menstrual cycle not all women menstruate but all women of a certain age are in theory supposed to and that can pose some challenges with um, with iron metabolism for example and um, some research we did at the university a few years ago when we surveyed our 300 odd female athletes and, and had their iron work completed, about 70% of our female athletes are iron deficient anemic. Um, it's a huge challenge for female athletes and it's something that uh, does need careful management with diet and, uh, and, and medical intervention sometimes. Um, and I think it's, it's partly, for me, part of the concern with that is um, dietary trends that I think young female athletes in particular find themselves following but not really being sure why or, or not really sure why they're following those trends so you know while we could talk all day about veganism and vegetarianism and I think you know there's a real ethical sort of moral conversation to be had there my concern is when athletes embark on a diet like that or you know a vegan vegetarian lifestyle without getting appropriate help because then there are complications with iron with b12 potentially calcium there's lots of things that can be missed whenever um whenever people embark on these things without a, appropriate professional help um, and bone mineral density is a challenge, if not now for females, and 
I know Marie is always promoting resistance training and female in female colleagues, never mind athletes, but our bone mineral density is so critical until we're about 23 years of age for females, we have an opportunity to lay it down that unfortunately with the withdrawal of estrogen, when we hit menopausal age, we lose the protective effects on our bones. So the decisions and the nutrition decisions that these young athletes are making now actually will impact them quite greatly in, in years to come. Um, and lastly, for me, the other thing that I'm often really interested in, and I spend a lot of time working in this space is in gastrointestinal distress as well. Um, you know, that is something that females consistently report more, more of than males. And it may well be related to the time or phase of their menstrual cycle, but regardless of the trigger for it, it impacts their fueling and it can impact, they might eat more of maybe a food that is not going to give them the good nutrients that they need around the time of menstruation, or they eat less because they just don't feel well. And then they're trying to fuel maybe an important race or an event or training on very little fuel. So I think gastrointestinal distress is an area that I do focus on with females as well. And then obviously, you know, not to, to kind of go over things again, but the menstrual cycle, um, you know, a typical menstrual cycle in theory, 28 days, but can, can stretch anywhere between 21 to 35. We have that. We have a lot of our females are using the um, oral contraceptives or, you know, implantation devices that masks a lot of what we know, what we think we might know about the menstrual cycle. Um, we have lots of athletes. I work with a few who, you know, are oligomenorrheic, polymenorrheic, or some who have never menstruated. So, I think uh, it certainly is part of my conversation because if that is um, flagged as an issue during a meeting with an athlete, then that's something that absolutely has to be a center point for that athlete's health and medical care thereafter. So those are just my thoughts. Thanks so much, Emma. Uh, Lauren, we'll jump to you. Yeah, thanks, Poonam. I think it's so helpful to listen to my colleagues because I, I more and more realize how much our work does intersect. Um, I think Maria, one of the things she said is recognizing that not all women are the same. And so in my role and working in mental health and in mental performance, I think that's one of the, the first things that I'm recognizing and considering when I'm working with an athlete, a female athlete, uh, is just really considering individual differences. So being a woman is part of the identity and then is going to intersect with many other aspects of identity. And so um, I typically take what I would call a biopsychosocial framework to the work that I'm doing um, with all athletes and just considering females in particular, uh, you might think just in the way that that sounds. So biological factors, um, this is a woman, what are the physical health components that we've just heard um, my colleagues mentioned many of social factors, so peers, support systems, and then also considering how females interact with their peers and support systems in a different way um, and value typically the relationship in a different way than their male counterparts. Um, and then the psychological factors. So what are their coping mechanisms, um, their self-esteem, their mental health currently and mental health history. And I think, especially as it relates to mental health, it's really important to highlight that our female athletes, similar to females uh, across populations are experiencing rates of depression and anxiety at higher, um, at higher rates than, than our male athletes. So, um, I think everything I'm going to speak to, I think we can acknowledge that our male athletes would experience these things as well, but it's just um, a rate disparity. So the depression, the anxiety, the eating concerns, which like Emma said, impact um, adequate fueling. Um, Amanda spoke to body image. Uh, we have um, higher incidences of sexual assault and harassment and safe sport issues in our female population. Um, and I, so I think then what comes with that is just really to consider this within the sport culture and sport context, right? So when I'm meeting with an individual, I'm considering all these individual aspects and how they're all intersecting and in all the layers of this. And so typically then in sport culture, like we've been hearing male dominated, um, coaches are typically male of our female teams, largely statistically. Um, there's messaging in sport culture, if we just use body image as an example, 
um, around what the female athlete body should look like in sport culture. And then there's going to be individual sport differences. Um, and then there's also going to be personal differences and, and ideals around, you know, aesthetics. And then again, like just with that mind body connection, how that's all going to play out and in, in impact performance. And so because I work also in the mental performance realm, really thinking about like positive psychology and elevating performance, we really have to consider mental health as the foundation for mental performance, because if our female athletes aren't well um, at that foundational level, we really uh, are, are going to struggle to begin to elevate performance into that positive psychology space. Um, I think the other thing that I would just highlight in working with, with female athletes, and, and um, this probably rings true for male athletes as well, uh, that it's just really important in my work to create space uh, to understand their lived experience um, and, and really meet them where they're at in terms of their goals for change. So I think in sport culture, um, it's really normal that everything is very structured and systematic and our athletes um, are told where to be and when and, and what they're training and, and their lifts and everything's like very scheduled and, and routine. And although that I think is, is really helpful in many ways and of course is, is designed um, for certain reasons, what it leads for some of them to, ha uh, to happen, and especially see this a little bit more with our female athletes, is that their, their ability to really actually tune in and recognize what their own needs are in the moment um, is, is a little bit limited because of the, the system, right? And so I think when I'm working with individuals, really, like I said, meeting them where they're at, recognizing what their goals are, and then trying to help them develop autonomy, I think, really, at the end of the day, to know themselves better, um, really, I think of it in, in line with a physical analogy, um, a physical injury analogy, right? Like, what are your signs? What are your own symptoms? Um, and what is your, your treatment plan going to be to, to take care of yourself so that you're able to be optimally functioning in your mental health, and then elevating that into, into the performance realm in the, in the field of play? Um, so I think those would be some of my main considerations that working with our female athletes. Fantastic. No, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so great to hear from each one of your perspectives as to how you would work with a female athlete. Because I think, you know, even back to my own experience as a female athlete, now as a female coach, working with female athletes, like there's still so much that I'm learning. And if there's a lot that I'm learning in this space, then that means that, you know, we need to have more of these conversations. Um, and it's really great, you know, to, as a programmer myself to understand, you know, how can I, as a coach, make some impacts. Um, so that leads to our next question, actually, which is for Maria and Lauren. Um, and so again, you know, what are some actionable strategies or approaches that we can take when working with female athletes. Um, we'll start with Maria and then we'll go to Lauren. Okay, can you guys hear me? Sorry, that was my son just saying I'm not having a bath tonight. <laughs> I said, that's your dad's problem right now. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Thanks for, thanks for that question, Poonam. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of take this question from two perspectives. I'm going to answer the first one, like wearing my coach's hat. Um, you know, as we know, female athletes are starting to have a good amount of mentors in their life, uh, but perhaps not enough. And I know when I was playing sport uh, in my teen years, I had to kind of see it to be it right and and i would say only about five percent of all the sports that you see on tv are are female sports and so i think we definitely need more of that exposure um so women can see uh, girls can see women playing sports but they, they could also see coaches that are women on the sidelines um we know that you know um 
female sport participation has grown tremendously over you know the last decade but we also know that there's a massive uh, dropout around those teenage years so I think as coaches uh, and I, I used to coach the U16 level but now I'm, I'm coaching more that varsity um, adult senior level um, we need to really kind of empower women right um, and I think maybe the coach um, athlete connection might be stronger for female athletes than males. Um, I think males, you know, can, can maybe, you know, not like their teammate, not like their coach and still continue on with the sport. Whereas for females, those relationships, um, are a little bit more important. So really showing your athletes that you care, um, that will definitely, you know, help foster some positive experiences. So they will continue to go in, into sport. And uh, as with everything, I think communication is, is key, uh, with working with a female population, you know, having those honest, um, hard conversations uh, when needed is, is really important for athletes to continue motivating themselves and, and staying participating in, in sport. Um, so I think we kind of need to build that, need to do a better job at building that trust and, and that um, psycho, um, psychological safety, not just for just females, but obviously for, for all athletes. And so that's something that I try to do as a coach um, when I'm working with female athletes. Um, more from like an organizational perspective or like a technical leader. Um, I think our athletic departments, our provincial organizations, our national bodies, um, we need to move with the times and, and start to not just educate coaches and have them tick the box of that workshop that you attended, but really start launching some, you know, gender equality proposals and strategic plans that have some realistic strategies and goals in mind, right? Um, from a coach development perspective, I gave you guys some stats earlier on about how there's not enough women coaching women. Um, and I would say what we can do better is from a recruitment perspective. And that's something that I'm hoping to do with my masters a little bit more is, is try to recruit more women to, to get these masters that could then become the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, but women will not go into coaching careers unless there are viable career options for them, right? So competitive salaries, for example, is something that I think we need to kind of uh, move the, the needle a little bit. And once women are in these positions, you know, what does a professional development look like? What kind of support systems are we putting in place? What kind of resources do these women have? Um, and, and speaking from experience, but also looking at the research, networking and mentorship relationships are very important for females. So really fostering those environments where, you know, females can be at the peer level and, and really collaborate and advance each other's careers. Um, that's something that, you know, from as far as something that we do in our cohort in, in the master's program is really initiating those mentor-mentee relationships. And it doesn't need to be somebody that is in your discipline or in your sport. So for example, I'm, I'm part of a World Rugby Women in Sport um, program right now, who's it's two years long. And, and my um, mentor is Wendy Patton, who's the CEO for uh, CSI. And she's not a rugby person, and I didn't want a rugby person. I wanted somebody that comes from a very different background. And our conversations are, are very rich. And we talk about what does it mean to be a, a mom in a sport where there's lots of travel days? Uh, what does it mean to, to have good conflict management strategies when you're primarily working in a room full of males, right? And rugby is kind of that, that sport where it is very male dominant. Um, and so I, I really value that relationship that I have with her and, and formalizing those relationships uh, with women that are making coaching or technical leadership like a viable career option for them is really important. And then lastly, with everything is retaining women in sport. And so do we have good career progressions for them? Um, going back to the idea of are the salaries can um, uh, competitive so they can actually, you know, make a good go at this as, as a career. So um, from a coaching perspective, I really kind of some of actionable strategies that, that I that I try to adopt when working with female athletes is really just setting that foundation of trust and the relationship. And that's that's really important. Um, and it's great that I've done it. So they, they see some credibility to that. But like Lauren and the other women have been saying is not two experiences are the same. So my path looked one way. That doesn't mean I'm I'm wanting that same path for you, uh, nor expecting that path to look like that for you. And so just kind of moving and, and adapting with that and, and more from an administrative 
kind of level, you know, offering these opportunities uh, to women, you know, supporting them while they're doing it. So they actually retain and, and stay in, in this career because coaching is, is a beautiful career path. You know, um, there's lots of positives to it. Um, there are barriers like there are in any other fields. And, and uh, like I said, the, the growth is there, the development is there, uh, but making sure that we have women at these uh, boards, right? Women need to be at the table when it comes to being on boards and making policies and really having more of a systematic uh, influence on what's happening in sport here in Canada. So that's it for me. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, yeah, Lauren, from a psychological perspective, I'd like to pose the same question. What are some actionable strategies or approaches that we can take? Yeah, thanks again, Maria. It's so great to follow you. I, I think we have a lot of uh, the same ideas. And so I, th I think I can't, um, I, I'll repeat some of your messaging. I think um, in sport, we know reps are, reps are helpful. So I think the education is so, so key. And I think one of our challenges is that these opportunities, including this opportunity this evening are, are often um, one-off opportunities. And I, I think we, we can't expect our coaches to really um, know this information and integrate it into creating environments for our athletes to really thrive if it's not part of a more kind of routine part of ongoing professional development. So I think um, I would encourage our, our coaches to, to think about opportunities to keep learning about working with female athletes and keep learning about ways that they can create those uh, safe, psychologically safe environments for athletes to thrive. Um, and, and I think like Maria said, also at then at that departmental and organizational level, how we can make these kinds of opportunities part of ongoing professional development to really um, support our coaches in being able to, to create um, some shifts even in, in, in the culture. Um, and, and also, again, in line with Maria, I think the relationships uh, obviously are, are so key. And so I, I might just even kind of operationalize that um, a little bit more into to helping those who are listening, thinking about how to develop those relationships. And I think it's really helpful to think about um, how would you make an athlete feel really safe to disclose and discuss with you some of the most challenging things that they are experiencing, um, knowing that they may be worried about consequences such as reduced playtime, um, perhaps uh, being treated differently or even awkwardly, or perhaps worrying about being judged. Um, I, I think it's really helpful to just even pause and, and reflect and think, you know, like, what would that conversation look like? What would that sound like? Um, how would I want, you know, if that were me, right, if we really try to embrace empathy and practice empathy and stepping into another person's shoes, what would I want someone to say to me? Um, how do we want to talk about mental health in, in the context and environments of our teams and our, and our organizations so that athletes do feel uh, like they can disclose these things and can ask for help when they need it. I think uh, culture change takes work and it takes time and sport culture is, is just, um, it just is competitive and it, and it can be ruthless. And so I think there's, you know, that conflicts in some ways, right? How do we create a sense of safety and support and also maintain that, that uh, compete, which is, is essential to performance. Um, I think within that, I invite our coaches um, and everybody, and, and myself included, who are working with female athletes to do personal reflection, ask ourselves questions, right? What are our ideas, assumptions, biases that we might hold about working with female athletes? Um, because the ideas that we hold about female athletes, just as an example around how I think my female athletes typically cope with pressure or stress, um, how I think that they might typically express themselves when they are dealing with something challenging or they're emotional. Um, and, and literally, you know, I think a, a psychological uh, kind of 
tagline that we often use is ink it, don't think it, right? We can have lots of great ideas, but putting pen to paper is really powerful. So take a pen, take a piece of paper, and I invite you to take time to write down some of the beliefs uh, and perceptions and attitudes you hold about the females that you, athletes that you work with and coach. Um, and how those then might influence the actions you take uh, and the attitudes you bring and the conversations you have with your athletes. Um, I think in order to develop these supportive, empathic, um, and compassionate conversations, to have these conversations, we have to think about uh, how we're received in that space, right? What is my body language, right? You know, almost you know, like we invite our athletes to use video uh, to kind of inform performance, right? So if I were being videotaped in my interactions with my athletes, um, what do I actually look like and sound like when I'm engaging with them when they maybe are anxious or uncomfortable or even fearful? Um, and I think that the added kind of layer that I might um, kind of, um, include here at the end is just to practice having these conversations. I think our athletes have to know that we care about them as people um, before we care about them as athletes, uh, before they will care what we have to say. And so what I mean by that is that take opportunities to get to know your athletes, have conversations that are not just difficult, but, but meaningful. Um, do you know very much about your athletes out sport of, outside of the sport context, um, aside from the courses they take and um, the interactions you've maybe had briefly with their family? I think, um, like I said, in order for our athletes to feel truly safe to disclose um, some of these challenging experiences, they really have to feel cared about. Um, and that, so that empathy and that understanding really has to be demonstrated. And in some ways, our coaches have to be, um, and our administrators, and, and even myself in my role as a mental health pr practitioner, we, we have to be willing to demonstrate some of our own vulnerability uh, in, in appropriate ways to, to support and foster our athletes in developing that same kind of vulnerability and, and resiliency um, in coping with with the things that they are, are faced with in this challenging, um, competitive and exciting uh, sport environment. Amazing, thank you, Lauren. Uh, yeah, I mean, two key takeaways that I'm taking from this, you know, around culture change is one from Maria where she spoke about just policy change and, and getting involved at that strategic level. Um, and, you know, we have so many examples of the benefits that that's had on female development and female performance. Um, so yeah, I think that that's such a key takeaway. And the second is from you, Lauren, that personal reflection piece, you know, really kind of looking at what are, what are our assumptions and biases that we're bringing into the workplace um, and calling it out. And that's kind of all about that learning and growth opportunity there. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, final question that we have is for Sam, Amanda, and Emma. And that is on what are we currently doing in this space? What are some of our next steps and how can we continue to elevate our female athletes? Emma, we'll start with you. Okay, I am, um, I'll start with the first part about what we're currently doing, Poonam. And I think, um, you know, like events like this or something that um, obviously it's International Women's Day and this is a spotlight on on females in sport and, and the like amazing panelists we have here today. But this should never be the end of the conversation one day a year. It has to keep going on. Um, I think, you know, I can only speak from my perspective, um, from a nutrition perspective perspective. Uh, you know, the, the Okanagan Charter that UBC put together a good few years ago really placed mental health and physical well-being at the center of student life here on campus. And UBC athletics, you know, UBC is a huge campus, so I know parts of it well in terms of the different departments, but athletics for sure. Um, by hiring a dietitian in a part time position are uh, really stepped up to the mark with that. Um, if you compare UBC athletics across other institutions in Canada, we're one of the only few that have a part time dietitian. When I started, we were the only one that had a, a you know, a, a position that was not contract based, that was not consultancy, that actually placed nutrition at the center of an IST, which was a huge step forward. Um, there are um, four mighty forces of dietitians on campus at UBC, but it's not enough. 
Um, you know, even in the area, Lauren and I have spoken many times about the area of eating disorders, which, you know, somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of females on campus at any university in North America experience an eating disorder of some degree. Um, and, you know, it's even, it's going to be even higher in an athletic world. Um, and it, there's just not enough resources and not enough specialization to really help an athlete. Um, I, I'm not saying help an athlete, you know, cure that, help an athlete fix that, but help an athlete have an open conversation about that. Um, the stories in the Globe and Mail of late, there was a series that was done last year, and it was just heartbreaking to read many of the stories of the athletes that we celebrate on such a high platform here in Canada who were really struggling with eating disorder behaviors and had nowhere to go. Um, and it is an area that I think um, universities in Canada and sports departments really need to step up and start addressing because it's a, it's a huge mental health issue. Um, and you know, funding is being cut from our public health system here in BC to deal with eating disorders. And, and it's not the right thing to do. So I think UBC Athletics are doing a lot very well, but there's just so much more to do. Um, I think, you know, what excites me, this area of female athlete health, I think there's the ceiling's pretty high. Like women are achieving some pretty awesome things with such little attention and such little knowledge about what we've been doing with our physiology and our training. Um, and I was speaking to an athlete last week, you know, about sort of this area of menstrual health and we're working on that. Like women need to start embracing their differences as their ergogenic age. Like it's a huge advantage to have these fluctuations in our hormones. And we can really, you know, with some changes in training, with some changes and an improvement in coaching awareness, we can make our athletes even better if the conversation is just a bit more natural. Um, and I know many coaches have spoken to me in, in the last few years where, you know, they, they're curious they're nervous particularly male coaches let's face it you know they're they're curious but they're nervous and they don't even know where to start with their female athletes with these conversations and I think um even the fact that some of them are here or maybe listening to the recording afterwards that already shows that you're in a much better position than maybe you were a few years ago where this was all new information to you um so I think yeah just supporting our athletes to you know associate their differences with their health and well-being and their performance is only going to get better based on that um, and then like I already said at the start you know I think there's so many things there's, there's so much low-hanging fruit for our athletes here at UBC that with simple changes in their diet they can just make their performance even better um, you know a, a real passion of mine is that Maria already hinted on it that uh, nutrition is not one of these tick the boxes you know the dietitian comes in once a year and talks to us about nutrition and unfortunately because of the the nature of the service sometimes that's the way it is but we can educate coaches we can educate work with the wonderful GAs and SNCs that we have to make sure that there's touch points with nutrition more frequently so that athletes really do start to pay attention to that one two percent differences that nutrition can make and um and really start to impact their performance on a, on a daily basis, which over time will translate into just phenomenal gains in, in terms of their uh, sports performance. So, um, yeah, those will be some of my thoughts. Um, I think if, if coaches are, you know, not comfortable in the space and Lauren already sort of hinted at that, you know, talking to females about their health sometimes can be a bit difficult trying to do your best with making sure that if you're not the person that's going to talk to them, but you're working towards that, trying to make sure that someone else in the team, whether that's an assistant coach or, you know, someone else can take on that, uh, that kind of openness with the athletes to really just foster that culture of openness um, uh, and related to health and performance. Like I, again, I was using this example with an athlete last week. If a, if a male athlete had a headache or if they had a stomach bug that was affecting their training, they would have no problems telling their coach that it affects their health. And equally, if females are experiencing difficulties with their menstrual cycle that is affecting their performance, they should be able to openly just say, I'm not feeling great. And it's because it's that time. And that's the end of it. You know, there's no further conversation needed because everyone knows what that means for, uh, you know, training intensity or, or something like that. But we just really want to get to that point where it's viewed as something that is, um, is part of your health profile as an athlete, not something that makes you different or perform any less it's just part of our health check and our health care with athletes I'm not sure if I answered all three of those questions but yeah <laughs> no you answered perfectly thank you uh Sam let's jump to you 
Thanks. Yeah. And I'm, I'm go going to echo a lot of what uh, Emma has already said, but I think to me, you know, what are we doing now? I think we've done a really good job, not just at UBC, but across Canada and a lot of spaces across the world of awareness and education. I think everyone is, is at a point now where we, we know that women are different. We know that our physiology is different. And so to me, the next step is, okay, what do we do with that knowledge and awareness? Um, and so building on that is, is kind of that education piece and, and that action. Um, so obviously we talked about the lack of research and that, you know, on the, the science side of things, you know, it'd be great to have more research around these areas to kind of solidify some of the things that we already know, but fill those gaps in places that we don't. Um, but then if you're looking at more of a, a landscape coaching support staff, you know, at least personally, one of the, the areas that I think, you know, we really want to continue to push forward is, is expanding our ISTs, expanding our coaching staff to include the diversity in practitioners and staffing that reflect the diversity in our athletes. Um, you know, a comment that was made to me when I was working with some of the national teams is that they would love to have me on the road because both their head coach, their assistant coach, their chiropractor and their physio and their strength coach were all men. And so they'd spend six months on the road with an entire staffing of men. So when I would come into the picture for a training camp, the female athletes would love having me around because it was you know, a female role model, a female perspective. It was someone that they could speak to. So I think you know, this speaks more to the athlete as a whole and not just specific to their, their health necessarily, but that you know, there needs to be that representation um, so that they have a safe space, someone that they can talk to. You know, there's mental health aspects to that, but there's also, you know, maybe they're not comfortable talking about their menstrual cycle to their head coach, but maybe that's an odd comment that they would make to me at lunch. And I can pass that on on their behalf to say, you know, this person's feeling a little bit under the weather and they, they kind of get the picture from there. So I think moving forward, it's it's really building, you know, our, our sport system to allow for athletes to feel comfortable in being who they are, um, male, female, um, you know, however they want to uh, represent themselves. It doesn't matter. We need to have those people and those safe spaces for them as well. Um, and then I think strategically, Maria touched on this really, really well earlier is that, you know, we need to be strategic in how we go about this. You know, I think there's a lot of people that are doing great work in a lot of these spaces, but you know, can we do it more efficiently? Can we learn from one another? Can we go farther together? And I think that, you know, the old proverb, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And I think this is, you know, one of those spaces where, you know, we want to go far with this. So, you know, let's all go together and let's move in that direction um, rather than just kind of all trying to you know, trudge forward on our own and, and have our own path and discover that, you know, someone's already done this and we could have learned and, and moved a little bit farther beyond that. So to me, those are kind of the three buckets. And I think awareness is, is kind of, you know, we've got the check mark there. Let's, let's move the education and the action and the strategy forward. Love that, Sam. Let's go far together. I absolutely love that. Um, Amanda, let's end with you there on that question. Sounds good. Um, so just going back to kind of some of the earlier considerations that I mentioned, uh, I'm going to touch on those a little bit more, um, more detail just in terms of like when I'm designing a strength and conditioning program, uh, what I'm factoring in is those physiological and psychological aspects of an athlete's development. Um, but I would say this isn't just for athletes, it's for everyone really. Um, and I think strength and conditioning is one of those things that uh, like every single person benefits from and it should look pretty similar um, for everyone um, and just like keeping up with our health and well-being. So um, yeah, while some of these are maybe a bit more specific just because I work uh, with athletes, I think they can be um, brought to the kind of general population as well. Um, so I'd say the first, um, biggest kind of bucket and the main reason that I got into strength and conditioning uh, in terms of coaching is uh, to be able to help someone decrease their risk of injury. Um, I've had quite a few injuries of my own um, and they were not fun to go through. Uh, it was, I've probably spent five years of my life rehabbing. Um, and so that wasn't something that I um, loved to go through. And I saw some of the gaps in that area or some of the ways that it was really preventable. Um, and so that's kind of, yeah, how I got into it and, and why I'm so passionate about this area is um, 
like there's a lot of things that we can do to help reduce the risk of injury. Um, and on top of that, it's also helping our general health uh, and uh, furthermore, like optimizing our performance. Um, and so I think in order to really uh, capitalize on some of this training, we just need to start to like really embrace and welcome strong and fit females um, in whatever shape and size that comes in. Um, and we're exercising to feel a certain way and to perform a certain way, not to look a certain way. Um, and so that's kind of the perspective that I try to bring with everyone that I work with. Um, diving into like injury specifically, um, I mentioned, you know, there's a higher risk of a lot of specific injuries in females. And while some of it uh, are factors are more like intrinsic factors that we can't change, um, I do think there are, are a lot of extrinsic factors that maybe go overlooked, such as like the environment and societal aspects of uh, youth sport development and in particular like female sport. Um, so just that like access and resources that these athletes are getting um, at a young age and also as they go through tends to be um, fewer and less in quality. Um, and so you're basically just not as robust of an athlete. You're not learning and being exposed to these different types of training, the proper technique, um, load management, those type of things. And so those, those are more systemic changes that we can definitely make in terms of um, like the sport layout within Canada, but I would say across most of the world um, is just making sure that we're investing more in our younger athletes so that we can have more staying in sport uh, and performing well in sport. Um, yeah, that would be more like systemically, we've got to do a better job uh, getting in and helping and supporting our younger um, and youth athletes. Uh, if we are dealing with a larger, or sorry, an older group, uh, which I do more specifically now, um, I would say like they should all be strength training at least twice a week and they should be doing it year round and it should be uh, like multi-joint, multi-movement uh, training sessions where we're focusing on uh, building up our musculature, but also working on our jumping and landing mechanics because we know that's where most injuries occur. Um, and also some of our like neuromuscular control and balance because we know that um, that is uh, an area that is maybe a bit tougher that we struggle in a bit more than males. So um, being really specific with the type of training that we are giving our females um, and knowing that they do have the potential to adapt very well and to have um, to be great athletes, um, even though we are like a bit shorter or smaller or uh, have a higher body fat percentage compared to males. Um, that's not, it's not a limiting factor for us being able to perform at a really high standard. So um, yeah, taking a bit more care and um, emphasizing like our strength training, uh, but also um, what we're doing and what we're doing before and after our training session. So obviously as a strength and conditioning coach, I'm not around for all of their training, um, but I'm trying to support our athletes in terms of what they should be doing for warmups, um, any like individual prehab work, uh, cool downs, recovery sessions. Um, that's more so helping the athletes individually, uh, but then also stepping back and working with the coaches on like, what does your weekly training plan look like? What does that look like over the month, over the year? Um, are we making sure that we have enough rest days? Um, are we making sure that we're reducing our risk of overuse injuries, um, but still having our athletes perform at a high level? So that's kind of what we're currently doing and we'll continue to do and, um, uh, and try to improve. Um, and then the other piece I would hit on is just like, yeah, strength and conditioning is a very male dominated field. Um, and so some things that I've found to be very effective um, and that have come off, I would say very well and, or that a lot of athletes haven't maybe seen or heard before because I have been the first like female strength and conditioning coach is just um, like taking that more empowering approach uh, and being really careful with my words around like language and comments surrounding body image, um, talking more so about like effort and progress rather than um, like the weight that they're doing or the way that they look, um, making sure that my 
own attitudes and beliefs about like food and weight and body image and all that is positive um, and is supportive of them and, and their goals. Um, and then just really stressing the idea of like, what do you need to do um, to perform as an athlete um, and really take, yeah, the pressure and the, um, the focus off of kind of that body image aspect or um, yeah, just that, that space and can, that can get uh, quite full of just like male testosterone and hormones and uh yeah this that like has some um yeah preconceived notions around like that space itself and um and what it looks like and what they need to do um and then last i'll just finish off with uh like next steps um and how are we going to help support and elevate our female athletes um, a space that I've more so been moving into in the last year is really just looking at um, optimizing our health and well-being first. So I think Emma had said that uh, just before, but um, yes, there are high-performing athletes, but there's a lot of things like low-hanging fruit and things in terms of just general health and well-being that are being missed um, or are not uh, being optimized. So almost taking a step back from like high performance sport and making sure that all of our bases are covered in terms of health and well-being, um, which for me, um, I'm starting to have conversations around like the impact of your menstrual cycle um, on your training and on your performance um, and what you as an athlete and or a coach can do to help reduce those negative impacts um, if you are experiencing them or to like help refer out to another specialist in that area um, if you do need to see a doctor for whatever reason um, but really just yeah taking that step back and making sure that um, do we even have like this vital sign um, under control and are we aware of it and are we working with uh, like our own physiology um, or are we just kind of ignoring that and kind of working against it or maybe doing all this spending all this time and energy working so hard but not getting that um, Return on, return on investment um, because we like either aren't sleeping enough or aren't fueling enough and are therefore um, have maybe lost our menstrual cycle and then like so forth and so forth, right? It goes on and on. Um, so yeah, like as, as much fun as it is um, going into the gym and lifting weights and going on field and doing movement sessions and running and jumping and all that, um, we do need to make sure that all of our, our bases are covered in terms of health and well-being because that's only going to help um, our, our performance and um, avoid some of these kind of like, whether it's mental or physical burnout that's happening in a lot of our athletes. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, okay, there's, I, there's two minutes uh, here that I want to take from the rest of you. And then I want to jump into Q and a, um, but very quickly, what are your hopes for female sport in the next 10 years or in the future? So Lauren, I'll start with you. What are some of your hopes for female sport in the future? Yeah, I'll give my, my really succinct answer. I think from a mental health perspective, I just would really hope that uh, these kinds of conversations become normalized. Right, so that we're just seeing it more commonplace, that there's opportunities for athletes to debrief, uh, ask questions, that people are checking in regularly with one another, um, that, that our coaches are leading by example in that respect, uh, maybe bringing in guest speakers and just having like more opportunities to have these conversations. I think um, like other panelists are saying, just to normalize um, that this is part of, of human experience um, for our female athletes. So that would, that would be one of my hopes. Thanks so much, Lauren. Emma, what about you? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's hard to answer this quickly, but I think um, positive uh, role models in terms of body image, I think is a huge thing. I, I think, um, social media environment and manipulation of images and people who are not involved in sport 
is having quite an influence on our athletes who are are not built to be that way. They're you know they're they're genetically different and and I think positive uh, role models in sports celebrating different sizes and shapes and what the human body can do would be hugely advantageous to our female uh, sporting environment. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, I usually like end most kind of talks or discussions with athletes on three things. One is to educate yourself. So like you're the one steering your ship. So make sure you're taking ownership and accountability in these areas and do what you can for yourself. Because as much as we're here to support you um, at the end of the day, like it's your body, it's your mind, you know that best. And so, um, yeah, really taking some of that ownership on educating yourself. Um, secondly, open up the conversation with others, because I'm sure if you're having those thoughts or struggling with something, uh, a peer or um, a teammate or someone else's as, as well, and um, it can be taboo subjects to talk about, but it is really important um, to help each other out and know that you're like not alone with some of those things. Um, and then the last one uh, is to like, how can you further the research in this area? Because it is really lacking on all fronts. Um, so how can we, how can we be better represented in um, like sports science uh, so that we can become better athletes um, and have, you know, prescriptions that are more tailored to us and not just copy and pasted from uh, like the male literature. Amazing. Sam. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more uh, cheesy with this one. I think, you know, in five, 10 years, I, I would like to be in a space where we're actually looking back and we're celebrating how far we've come um, and the progress that we've made with, you know, conversations that are, are happening right now. I'm loving the cheesy responses, Sam. Maria. Uh, for me, I'll go more from um, a, a system perspective. I would like to see more women at the table, um, at executive uh, boards, um, in management positions, and, and really having an influence on uh, sport policy. Amazing. Uh, okay, so we do want to jump into the Q&A portion. Um, so we do see a couple of questions in here, which is fantastic. Um, so first one is from Nate Wong. What are some good strategies for creating safe environments for our female student athletes as male staff on a male dominated staff, uh, or in a male dominated staff? So, um, who wants to jump in here? I'm thinking maybe Lauren, do you want to take a crack at this? And yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll offer, um, a couple things. And then if anyone else wants to add anything, um, I think just from the, I mean, if we're talking about, about safety in general, I, I mean, I think people um, are increasingly familiar with safe sport guidelines and rule of two, but I think I'll, I'll lean more into psychological safety just in, in my role. And I think, you know, the things I've been speaking about tonight have just really been to highlight um, that these are difficult conversations to have. Um, and I think being sensitive to that you're, the athletes you're working with and supporting with might be going through things that we uh, know nothing about. Um, they may not choose to disclose. So I think in, in every interaction, it's really important to be present and engaged when we're with our athletes. I think we're all very busy and depending on your role, um, it may not possibly be uncommon that you're multitasking. So I think if an athlete comes in to speak with you, it's important to put down whatever it is that you're doing and, and be present for the conversation. Uh, I think another layer of this that is really um, important and really paramount to the work that we do uh, is that nonverbal communication makes up, the research will suggest over 80%, sometimes upwards to 90% of communication. So if you think about your body language, uh, your facial expressions, uh, you know, I gave the kind of suggestion to do some, some self-reflection in one of my questions. And I think this is a, a place too, to think about like, what is the what are the messages we're sending perhaps without even saying anything or being aware of, of what we might be communicating um, just to try to make it safe for our athletes to have these conversations and, and to create these open and, and, and honest spaces. Um, 
And I think lastly, you know, there's some really excellent resources that UBC has put out and our coaches will know, I, I plug the UBC green folder over and over again. Uh, the green folder, just as an example of types of resources, outlines specifically uh, the type, the, the way to engage with a student when they're distressed, as well as the types of resources to consider. And so I think, um, someone else on the panel said something similar, right? Like you, you don't have to know exactly how to solve the, the problem um, or, or fix it, or even necessarily be the one to dive into the deep depths of the conversation. But I think if we can create space to listen to athletes, um, validate what they're saying, reassure them, and then connect them to the, to the appropriate resources and appropriate level of care. So I think, um, those would be the main things I would 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 highlight. Great, um, Maria. I'm actually going to ask you to to yeah share your perspective on the same question. Sure. I mean, Lauren has definitely touched on a lot of things. Obviously, um, you know, Nate as a as a male, and you're having females come to you. I think that that idea of uh, hopefully that trust foundation has already been laid out, which is maybe why they're even coming to you. So take a, you know, a little nudge of, of confidence there. Um, so that's really great. Um, but back to Lauren's point, I think, you know, you don't need to have the answers to everything that they're coming at to you with, um, putting them to the right experts. And, you know, you know that as an AT, everyone wants to practice within their, their scope um, and making sure that if somebody has, uh, you know, issues with something that you don't have the expertise to work within that you redirect them to somebody else and and that that piece of empathy is is really important, um, you know, um, relating uh, to that athlete and, and making sure that they feel safe and, and, and thank them for for coming to you I'm sure that was, you know, tough for them to do that in the first place so um, I don't know if I added much value there but that's my answer. No, that's great. Uh, let's move on to Carmen Bott's uh, question. Hey, Carmen, uh, do you think this burnout situation and mental well-being focus is unique to Western culture? Do you think considerations for female athletes might be different across cultures and countries and societies? Um, definitely seems like a Lauren question, but maybe we'll leave Lauren to the end and see if somebody else wants to jump in first. We could probably combo it like she added a second piece about body image too. Yeah. So we could answer all of them. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to throw in my two cents on the, the body yeah. image side of things. And uh, Carmen, I think it's a great question. You know, this is a, a big challenge in terms of us being kind of a, a product of the research that's been done out there. Like most of the sport nutrition research on body image and eating disorders is done predominantly in North America, the United Kingdom and Australia. They're, they're the countries with the longest history of sports institutes that we have and certainly in nutrition as a discipline. I mean, I'm not a global expert on this. I, I don't really have good data to quote you on this, but you know, athletes being celebrated for different or, or individuals being celebrated for different body shapes and body sizes is is absolutely something that we know that happens in in different cultures and um you know if you take the kenyan long distance runners for example an incredibly different physique to some of the you know the, the smaller more powerful say gymnasts that we see in the olympic games so i i do think um not to say that there's not body image um, biases or concerns within different sports and different populations, but I think it would not be right for us to apply what we know in Western culture to other countries. Um, I, I think uh, Lauren's probably going to speak more to the, the mental health side of things in, in North America, but I think from, from my perspective, I can just talk about the data that's been produced in those areas. And, uh, and uh, that's where most of the, the stats and most of the data comes from, but I think it is a really interesting point. Lauren, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think um, I, I think I would be remiss to to say no to that question, right? I think uh, you know I started my uh, response to the initial question just talking about a, a biopsychosocial framework, and so I think. Um, each of our athletes is going to have an experience. Excuse me, I'm going to clear my throat. 
that um, reflects their, their identity and, and unique differences. And, and we also see mental health um, experiences look different in, and are, are spoken about differently in Western culture. Um, and so I, I can't, uh, you know, begin to pretend I know exactly what it would look like or show up um, in, in uh, a different country or culture, but just from my lived experience and working with different athletes, you know, some, some athletes from different cultures will come in and more naturally speak about physical symptoms, um, and, and be more attuned to, and, and more likely to, to, um, identify physical symptoms before recognizing those to be perhaps related to mental health difficulties. Um, I think, you know, if we think about the mind body connection, um, in some ways, it's it's hard to consider one without the other. Um, and maybe just what the athlete is presenting with that we have to attune to and, and be curious about and learn more about. Um, but but I think yes, absolutely. Um, there's likely cultural and social influences across individuals experiences. Awesome. Well, I just want to be conscious of the time. It is 730. I knew this time was going to fly by. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank our presenters. Thank you for your expertise and sharing such useful knowledge with us today. Um, I know for a fact that we've sparked many minds here tonight. Um, and so we're really grateful for you to join us, especially on International Women's Day. Um, I also want to thank the UBC EDI committee for supporting us in, in hosting this event today. Um, and I just want to thank the entire group that helped us with, you know, through UBC AV group, um, Jamie and Hector helping with comms and marketing. Um, and just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I know it's a Tuesday in the evening, um, and we all have busy schedules, but we really appreciate all you do for female athlete health and for female sport. Um, yeah, and we just want to thank you so much. So that concludes the event and the presentation. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everyone.